Hello everyone and welcome to episode 8 of Cycling Research Review. Today I'm here with my colleague Samuel Niela Denking from the University of Amsterdam and we're going to talk about his latest publication on the fair distribution of road space. So what inspired you to write this paper? Yes, so I was actually, I'm, I'm doing my PhD here at the, the University of Amsterdam and there's a kind of sideline of the PhD and one of the things I, I've been interested for a long time um, is how space is actually distributed between different transport modes and it's the kind of thing which we often see, you know, like uh, on Twitter, GIFs, uh, small things like this, you know, oh, one cyclist or one car is, you know, the equivalent to six cyclists. Basically, oh, you know, don't pedestrians and cyclists get a bad deal in terms of how space is distributed, um, which they do, to be honest. Um, so then I, I figured out um, using Amsterdam as a, as a case study, so there's this um, um, high scale sort of GIS map so then you can actually map it all out um, and you find out that well like cyclists they get around 7% of, of all space so that's purely cycling tracks um, then pedestrians cars both get around 40% and of course that's all very interesting and but then I I was actually so once I'd done this I started wondering well what do these numbers sort of actually tell us and how useful are they? In your paper you talk quite a bit about how transport justice studies focuses on larger scale issues uh, such as the, on the level of the city or the level of a neighborhood. You in this paper now focus on the scale of the street. Can you tell us why that's important in your opinion? Well I think potentially one of the reasons like transport planners they've, they've tended to focus on this very sort of urban urban wide uh, scale is is the connection with issues with accessibility I think and things like you know transport poverty and um, so these sort of big you know big structural forces and and this the realm of the street sort of at a, at a small scale it's tended to be something which uh, we've tend to think oh well let's just leave that up to engineers or urban designers um, but of course ultimately the the big scale is you know it's lots of small things you know if you add it up um, so I think now, but also from geographers, I think we're starting to see sort of a, a push to really focus on, yeah, on street level issues. You write on page 11 of your paper that, ironically, arguments in favor of a fairer distribution of road space among different modes by sustainable transport advocates end up unwittingly reproducing the traffic engineering mentality that they are seeking to criticize. Could you speak a bit to why you think that's the case? Yeah, so I think I think this is kind of the the big paradox, which which actually sort of motivated me to to write to write it up as a as a paper. So this is the, precisely the kind of thing I was I was previously saying. You know, you you'll see on Twitter things like that. Um, you know, one car is the equivalent of however many cyclists or however many pedestrians, and all of this is you know goes to point out how inefficient cars are. Um, so of course, if you, if you take that as a starting point, then you very quickly reach the sort of the conclusion that well, then why shouldn't we actually just give cars less space and you know give pedestrians, cyclists more space, so everyone kind of has a, a fair a fair amount of of space. But then the interesting thing is that if you take that logic up to its sort of like in, um, up to its logical conclusion. Well, it doesn't always come out in favor of pedestrians or cyclists. So in, in Amsterdam, for example, we can say cyclists have got 7% of the space, but they're around one third of the trips, right? Yeah. So, okay, so why not give them around one third of the space? Um, but then the interesting thing is that if you take pedestrians, well, actually, pedestrians already have more space then they'd kind of deserve yeah. if we follow this same logic. Yeah. Um, so actually, you know, they'll have like around 40% of the space, but you know, 40% of trips in Amsterdam are not made by pedestrians. Um, yeah, that you could also think of a of a city in which, I mean, many U.S. cities, right? You might say 70% of the trips are made by um, private car. Does this mean cars should get 70% of the space? Well. Cars Probably not, right? Yeah. <laughs> so which brings us to the provocative argument that you make that with looking at the size of the vehicles in the paper and, and how if you were to distribute road space by the size of the cars, 
then in many cities uh, you would have this very ridiculously unbalanced equation that's actually not in favor of the car. Yeah, so I think I think the the point here is that ultimately every transport mode, I mean they they're fundamentally different. Yeah. Um, not and of course size is one big element, but it's it's not only about size. It's also um, you know cyclists, for example, they they weave in and out of traffic very easily, mm -hmm. and that is. I mean, that's the great thing about cycling, right? That you can potentially move more people in less space. Um, so in this sense, you shouldn't, you shouldn't think that for cyclists, you need to treat them in the same way as cars. Even though they physically have these characteristics. Exactly. And then um, for pedestrians, for example, a big part of just being up and about, it's not, it's not about movement, right? You might sort of just hang around, stroll a bit. Um, and of course, for all of these reasons, the, the pedestrian realm, in a way, it needs to be much more generously spaced than, than the other realms. Um, so in this sense, like, if you're thinking about cars, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of normal for cars to pile up, right, at a, at a junction. But imagine, <laughs> imagine if pedestrians were given like, so little space that yeah. they were literally piling well, up behind yeah yeah that would make no sense right? um, so if you think about it really like what's more underutilized um, sidewalks or or you know or the actual car lane in, like, in many places it's probably sidewalks <laughs> right objectively I mean objectively, like in terms yeah. of capacity like you could fit more pedestrians in there yeah but uh, but the whole point is that like it's okay for the not to be pedestrians there it's kind of it's what's expected. I mean, they're just like and qualitatively like different. Comfort then come in as well, and, and uh, comfort, spatial, like uh, the aesthetics and and personal space, and all these measures are not included in just the physical. Measures. No, of course, of course. Um, could you tell us a little uh, about this street behind us? Because you have two pictures in your paper. Yeah. So about the transformation here. So now. this is an interesting street. It's the Sarfati Strat in in Amsterdam. And the, now they call this a uh, bicycle street. Yeah. And this is, has been like this uh, since about a couple of years ago. So basically it's sort of red paint and uh, that's kind of it. I mean, there's the tram in the middle, but that doesn't affect it. But, and as you can see, the, the main flow here is cyclists and they are meant to have priority. Um, and then cars, they sort of, they're allowed to use it, but as guests yeah. and in theory, which most of them do, um, they should yield to cyclists. But the, so the interesting thing is that this used to be different. Cyclists actually used to have a separate cycling lane. Um, and, then, and then there was a separate uh, car lane in which uh, also the, the speed used to be 50 kilometers per hour. Now it's down to 30. Um, but of course it's, it's shared. So in a sense you can consider it a shared space in which cyclists have priority. Which is exactly what gave you such difficulty when you were trying to do these analysis, right? Is these streets like this, like what do you classify it as, for example? Exactly, so in, in this sense, I think this is a, a nice example, which it, it kind of shows how this, this logic of separating, you know, into car space, cycling space, kind of, well, it, it breaks down um, at, a, at a certain point. And, and then we, I think we also need to question, well, you know, actually in some cases, mixing might be more advantageous so uh, in the case of cyclists i mean there there's actually been surveys which show that most people they prefer the new situation although in a way you could you could argue that they have less space yeah. um, but of course they also have more space in a, <laughs> in a different kind of way so as an alternative you actually propose looking at vehicle speeds in instead of looking at just the spatial uh, room that vehicles take up uh, could you suggest a few ways in which that could replace the current paradigm and how that could help the way we think about our cities? Yeah, in, in, in a way it's not, I don't think it's necessarily about replacing it. I mean, so actually if looking at, at space and how it is distributed, it, it, it can be important, I'd say, yeah. and it can be useful. Just don't consider it as the sort of the sole measure of, you know, what is right and what is wrong. Um, and in this sense, what, what sort of, what led me to put the focus in speed was, well, the wish to sort of give a bit of an alternative, right? As academics, like, we have this tendency, I think, to just like, um, 
criticize things and bring them down, sort of saying, oh, well, that's not right because you haven't looked at A, B, C. Um, but then, unless you sort of offer something else, mm -hmm. well, <laughs> how, how helpful yeah. are you being, <laughs> right? Um, so so I, I do think that at least as a, as a compliment, it is interesting perhaps to shift somewhat the, the focus from the purely spatial element to really thinking about um, traffic speeds. Um, and of course, there's, there's, there's been, you know, a big movement in sort of calmed streets, you know, um, traffic calm zones, home zones, I mean, call them, call them whatever you want. Um, but the whole point is that the lower the traffic speeds are in general in a, in a street or in a city, I think the more equality is created yeah. between users, right? I mean, the minute someone's going at 70 per hour, I mean, they basically get to decide what's going on they there. They become dangerous. Yeah, they become dangerous and also they effectively claim single ownership of, of the whole space. Um, if everyone's kind of, you know, 15, 20 kilometers per hour, well, on the one hand, that still, it allows for more flexibility, so you probably need to, you know, regulate less, you know, in a formal manner. Um, I mean, of course, there's the whole safety dimension, which is important, but it, I'd say it's only, it's only part of the picture. Um, but then, yeah, it, it just, I just think, allows for coexistence, you know, in a way, which, I mean, it, it is, in the end, it is the, the basic shared space argument, which I think has been, has been raised often. But then what I think would be interesting and what I kind of suggested in the paper is really sort of following the same logic of the, you know, oh, let's measure space distribution in the whole city. I mean, why don't you do that for speeds? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, really GIS play around, measure um, street speeds in every, you could do a nice little histogram and you could, you could really start hopefully seeing interesting things. Nice. Yeah. And Sam, where can they find you on uh, the internet? Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I think <laughs> I am probably much less uh, internet uh, savvy than, than you are. Um, but uh, I do have my, my Twitter, which exists and, you know, things, things do happen there. Um, I believe that I am called Nello Deacon there. Yeah. Um, and other than that, my University of Amsterdam homepage, I think, is the, is the best place for it. Nice. Thanks for joining us today for the interview. <laughs> My pleasure. And if you want to see more of Sam's work, I will link to the open access paper in the links below. And to find out more about him, uh, I will also link him to his Twitter. So do follow him if you like his work. And we will see you next week. And thanks for joining us. Take care. <laughs>